Good morning, everybody. Morning. Well, congratulations on the year of the glass. Uh, I, I can honestly tell you that I feel like a fish out of water. I feel like one of the one of the frauds in this audience because everyone has a specific expertise, either in form of science, technology, or art in glass. And I'm simply an admirer of glass. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about, from my perspective, the kind of work we do and where we're going to go with it. But you know, uh, rather than just jumping into a story, I'd like to follow Stephanie's uh, footstep and tell you a, an arc of the story and where this thing began. So uh, the story of glass, certainly for Savannah River National Laboratory, uh, has its birthplace in the Manhattan Project. So uh, right after the Manhattan Project, uh, over the next few decades, the US government uh, started working on uh, creating a nuclear stockpile. So what does a nuclear stockpile creation involve? Well, if you're gonna make nuclear weapons, you need nuclear materials. And to get nuclear materials, you have to produce that nuclear materials one atom at a time, right? Uh, the abundance of natural plutonium in the Earth is uh, infinitesimally small, so if you wanna make plutonium, literally you have to synthesize it one atom at a time. Well, that comes with a price, because as you make things like plutonium or other isotopes, you have to go through a ser series of uh, uh, nuclear processes, and then they have to go through chemical separation processes. And that results in very large volumes of nuclear material produced through separation. So those are basically uh, nuclear waste that you have to dispose. So what I've shown here is that from 1950s to 1980s, uh, to, for production of nuclear materials, there were 14 reactors working, nine at Hanford and five at Savannah River, that generated plutonium and tritium. And uh, the table on the right-hand side shows all the other isotopes we generated along with plutonium and tritium. Many of them have useful applications for various arenas, including medical applications. But all of that production of nuclear material result, resulted in 400 million gallons of high-level waste. Okay. So, you know, if they, they say if, uh, uh, if something happens in numbers, ones and twos are very significant and impactful. If it happens in numbers of thousands and hundreds of thousands, there are statistics. So, when you're talking about 400 million gallons of waste, simply the volume of that is uh, it, it's unimaginable to an uninitiated. So where do you put 400 million gallons of waste? Well, they're predominantly in three areas. They're at Savannah River uh, site, they're at Hanford site, uh, and they are at Idaho site. So every one of those sites is responsible for uh, coming up with a path forward of disposing that nuclear waste in a very safe way. So just to show you a couple of different examples, this is the Savannah River site on the right-hand side. I'm showing you the top of the tank farm. Uh, and those circular things are basically the top of the tanks buried underground. And a picture on the left-hand side shows you the first and generation of those tanks that are receiving all of this nuclear waste. Just remember, it's a hodgepodge of stuff various nuclei, various elements, plus either acidic material or basic material based on a process that it was dealt with. And it's been sitting there for five decades, which means you know, anytime you put a process in storage, you got chemical reactions that are taking place in there, as well as the erosion and corrosion of the tank, as well as forming sludge on the bottom, right? So these things are highly heterogeneous and also, uh, as I mentioned, because of the corrosion of the tanks, ultimately these are not long-term storage solutions. So we gotta do something about it. So uh, finally, uh, in about uh, 80s time frame, the Department of Energy decides, hey, we're going to study a, a number of different methodologies. How are we going to uh, safely take care of this nuclear waste? And ultimately, I'm just gonna show you the table on the right-hand side, which is all the stuff that was tried by the, uh, by the US government and all the researchers that got funded from DOE. And there was a short list that was produced, 
And the winner of the shortlist was alkali borosilicate glass as a way to entrain and sequester the material. Now, there are a number of other glasses that are possible for this application. Borosilicate glasses are uh, uniquely helpful because the boron itself not only is the compositionally part of the glass, but also from a nuclear perspective, it's, it does a good job absorbing neutrons. So for things that are still undergoing fission processes, boron is a good mediator. So um, the difference between commercial glass and a nuclear waste glass. From a commercial perspective, uh, the compositions are tailored for an intended use, right? In a nuclear waste glass, the composition ultimately, finally is defined by all the stuff that you put in there because they become part of that glass composition. So you have to work that very carefully. And what is the loading level of nuclear material you can put in the glass frit material so you have a stable material that doesn't leach out the components, right? So everything has to be compositionally uniform in the glass. So you have the entirety of the periodic table going into that glass and trying to formulate that in such a way that's, that remains stable for a very long time. And I'll tell you about that just in a few minutes. It's, 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 it's a complex process. So the ultimate glass uh, end product is tailored to meet the regulatory needs, which means the material has to be entrained for a very long time and cannot be extracted from that glass, right? So that's the final function. So from uh, 80s through 90s, at the laboratory and at the site, we uh, experimented with a lot of different melters. Just to, just to kind of give you a feeling for it, we pour tons of glass material. And ultimately, uh, we settled on one particular type of material and one part of, part of formulation. So this, this particular uh, uh, slide shows DWPF stands for Defense Waste Processing Facility. The uh, giant picture on the left-hand side, that's the melter that's being installed in that facility. It's melter number three. And it's a cylindrical melter. Um, inside, uh, we tend to move toward that direction. And if you look from the experiments that we've done, the melter number one, we pour 13 uh, 1,300 canisters of glass, melter number two, almost 3,000, and mel melter number three is currently in operation. So let me tell you a little bit about this melters. Well, when the glass is poured, they're poured into these stainless steel canisters, okay? And then, because we don't have a final resting position for the final disposition of these canisters, uh, it was originally designed to go to Yucca Mountain for long-term storage. For now, we have a field in H area that is those canisters that actually get inserted underground. They're very safe. They, there's, there's, there's very low residual radiation environmentally. It's very friendly. So. Uh, the picture on the upper right-hand corner, that's uh, downtown Aiken, the city that Savannah Riverside is, right? So this is, uh, you know, last night I was really enjoying listening about uses of glass in the art uh, and its composition. This is when life is imitating art. So in the city of Aiken, if you go there right uh, in front of the uh, AECOM, there is one of those stainless steel cylinders that sits there as a piece of art. So we no longer are interested in the glass as the art, but the thing that holds the glass is now the art. <laughs> so going back to melter number three, you can see it moving into the facilities, is actually working and is pouring glass. This is the canister, a stainless steel canister that's receiving that glass. Is a thermal photograph that shows you know, how the heat is distributed as the glass is being poured. I can assure you no person is present while we're pouring this glass because remember, it's highly radioactive, right? So other than thermal temperature, you also have radiation uh, things you've got to worry about. So everything is done mechanically and automatically. So this process is going very well at Savannah Riverside. Next is going to be Hanford on the deck that they're going to start processing their nuclear waste. The formulation for borosilicate glass is very mature at this point. And the whole ability to 
entrained nuclear waste material is very well understood by us. We know this is a threat safe process. Now, meanwhile, for three decades, Savannah River National Laboratory collected ceramic and glass scientists to do this type of research, right? So we've, we've invested a lot of time and effort trying to figure out this type of uh, uh, glass utilization, but we got smart people that are glass scientists. So as we look at the future of the laboratory, sequestration of the waste is really no longer in our future. This is something we've already done and it's behind us. So what is it that we're going to do next with glass that becomes more relevant? Well, we have a couple of different mechanisms at the laboratory that we can actually take advantage of internal funds generated through the work we do for federal government. Uh, that fund is put in a little bucket. It's called LDRD, Laboratory Directed Research and Development. And the reason that that fund is so unique to national laboratories is that you can fund things that absolutely have uh, no pedigree of success. So you can start funding activities that are really a pie in the sky. Uh, and you can try, truly, discovery science to see where can that take you. Uh, you can be patient, funded for one, two, or three years to see if there is any uh, potential for success. And then if things are really successful and you create enough data, then you can entice other government agencies that this is really the right way to go and continue with the process. So uh, as, as I will continue with the glass and ceramic uh, motif, let me just tell you about a couple of different areas that we've invested our LDRD. Well, one is that we're transitioning uh, from uh, glass as a sequester of waste, looking at the glass waste, what is it that we can do with it? Well, if you look at the structure of microglass, this is glass that's just completely pulverized and turns into particulate, it has a very similar structure to pumice stone. And pumice was originally used by Romans to, to make the Roman concrete. So through a partnership, we were able to actually use this valorized glass, you know, value added. We do a chemical modification that becomes more and more pumice-like. So as you mix it with cementitious material, it generates a very, very stable cement that you can use it structurally is very similar to Roman concrete. So what are some of the things that you get out of it? Well, it has a very high, uh, it, has, it, says it has a long lifetime, and it has a low carbon footprint. So if you're thinking for future, for coming up with a construction material that you need to have lower carbon footprint and a longer lasting time, this is one way we can utilize the glass. But in fact, that whole field has resulted in what we uh, have termed ECMs uh, which is engineered cellular magmatics. These are things that are pumice stone like. So what are some of the ways that we can use this ECMs that are chemically modified glass particulates? For one thing, I gotta tell you, as we go through the landfills, landfills to collect this waste glass, this process, you do not have to separate glass based on the color because we don't care about the elemental composition. We don't care about the color. We just care about the particle, particle size, and how we can chemically modify it to fit in the particular type of reactions. On the right-hand side, I've just shown you some of the research areas that we're working in. And that is, how do we take this microglass material and use it in biotechnology, in molecular chemistry, in, in physics and material, uh, other science classes in agricultural and in what we do normally, which is our job with the federal government, that's environmental cleanup. So let me give you a couple of examples. For example, uh, this particular grass material can be used to grow a class of bacteria on them. Uh, these are the bacteria that was, bacteria family that was developed and discovered by the laboratory. And they're very effective in chewing up hydrocarbons and then giving you a lower carbonaceous material. So imagine if you have an area that's contaminated with oil or uh, petroleum product and you're trying to clean that product from an environmental perspective, you can actually pass that effluent over this stabilized biologicals on glass 
and then through passive processes try to clean the environment. We're growing a class of diatomaceous earth on this uh, material because one of the fundamental flaws in microglass is its structural stability. Diatoms are biological organisms that have silicon as the backbone and they tend to find the flaw in this glass and actually use it as a nucleation and growth site. When they die, they literally leave these little tiny levers for you to hold that glass together. Uh, we're using it for um, we're using it for all sorts of applications and trying to identify more passive, passive and active forms of this glass for uh, the work that we do. So in short, basically 75% of the glass that you guys try to recycle, it ends up in a landfill. Very little recycling is done. Uh, the processes we use at this point are agnostic to the type of glass because again, we're going to work chemically and change the functionality of the glass. Um, and ultimately, the amount of energy goes, again, I was watching the art discussion last night and all I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from, a, from a personal perspective, I'm enjoying the, the, just the beauty of this piece, but from the chemist and engineering perspective, I'm, all I'm thinking is, oh my God, how much energy are we putting in this thing, right? <laughs> Develop the glass over and over again to come up with this beautiful part and pieces. So it, it's, it's interesting, you can't necessarily separate one from the other one. So we put a lot of energy to create this glass and, and simply trying to recycle them in terms of melting, that still requires a lot of energy. There are mechanical ways we can recycle this glass in a better form that actually has a very low energy footprint. So uh, finally, uh, we're working both internally within the lab and with a bunch of partners, trying to actually use AI engines to determine what's the best glass composition for best potential application at the end. Remember, if we want to move away from sequestration, what are the functional materials you want, either structurally, chemically, or physically, and that AI engine should be able to help you. We're using a standard glass uh, database. Uh, unfortunately, the format of the database is not compatible with AI engines and the way we do it. So the first step is to actually parse that database and trying to make it in a usable form. And again, internally, we have an LDRD funding project that funds that. So where we go tomorrow with uh, all of the glass research, I don't know because, again, it's an area that we are just in the discovery phase trying to use all of our glass and ceramic expertise, trying to come up with new ways to use glass. You know, the administration is really focused on low carbon footprints, clean energy, clean environment, and being able to take glass out of the landfills and start utilizing in both structural ways and physical ways that reduces either the carbon footprints or energy usage is certainly aligned with our mission. So thank you for your time.